New tonight, police say they've dismantled a dangerous street gang. Several other more gang members are behind bars tonight. Today we're going to profile one of the most talked about brims in the history of the L.A. brims, Little Country. It. I never stopped. I never stopped banging. I, I started banging hard, then I got so hard that it was a shame. Frederick Carlton Little Country Garrett was born August 9, 1954, in Nueces County, Texas. Nueces County is on the Gulf of Mexico, southeast of San Antonio. The county's largest city, Corpus Christi, 210 miles southwest of Houston and 145 miles southeast of San Antonio. Two major highways serve the county, Interstate 37 and U.S. Highway 77. Fred attended elementary and middle school in the Oasis, Texas, before moving to Los Angeles, California in 1969. The Garrett family landed on 58th and Hoover, just north of Slauson Avenue, just west of Hoover Street, and this area will become home to the untouchable Brims. The Garrett's moved into a house built in 1910. It's now a three bedroom, two bathroom, 1,296 square foot home with an estimated value of $588,000. Fresh out of Texas, 15 year old Fred Garrett attended John Muir Middle School in Los Angeles. John Muir used to give lunchtime dances at noon and we had to pay a quarter to get in. You know, the guys would be on one side and the girls girls would be on one side and you would have some in the middle dancing, right? Well, I love to dance. I still love to dance. Real thugs can get down on the floor. <laughs> and um, I was just out there dancing by myself on a good day. I wasn't high, I hadn't been drinking. And uh, he was on the wall. The country was kind of tall. And he had this long trench coat on him, and he wore jeans all the time. And he comes strolling across the floor. I don't know what the song was, but we just got the, you know, we just got the boogie in, you know. And um, I think after that, we just, you know, kind of, we, we just hooked up and stuff. About one year later, Little Country was already expecting his first child. This was a 70, uh, maybe around June or July, something I got pregnant in. You know, I didn't know. You know, I started getting uh, bigger. And I remember during the summer, you know, he would, uh, if, you know, it was still kind of hot that year. He would make me wear uh, a, a coat, you know. But I didn't know, you know, I didn't know he was trying to hide. <laughs> <laughs> then he got my ass pregnant, but his mama knew, you know, and uh, my, I remember my mother was going to New York to get my baby sister and brother from there, and uh, somebody found me on the streets. My sister did, and she said, Mama need to see you, and they took me to the airport, and before she took off, she said, you need to go home, you're pregnant, and I just started crying, you know. Uh, so I told him, I said, my mama said I'm pregnant. He said, you didn't know? I said, no, I mean, I'm going to have a baby. I don't know what to do with no baby. He said, we'll figure out something. But we, during that time, we were staying with Punkin. Punkin's mother, Punkin was locked up. Punkin stayed in and out of uh, YTA, right? was that YTS? Yes. Yeah, he stayed out of there. We, and I, me and Country used to go up to the uh, places with his mother. She'd give us red devils and stuff to, you know, keep her company taking them rides. And she would bring a lot of food. And I know I would walk out of there. I'd be stumbling. They should have locked me up. I'd be so loaded, you know. But anyway, we stayed over there off of Jefferson. And uh, 
I, I think it was around fourth day, fifth day. We stayed over there for, with her for a little while. And instead of going home, I went to my older sister house. She lived off of 68 in Vermont. And um, eventually I went home because I start, you know, I started having some problems with my brother-in-law, right? And I told Little Country, and you know, he said, okay, we, we, we're going to take care of this. So one night he walked me home, and my brother-in-law was in the um, den. And he immediately jumped in front of my face and said, let's slow the ass. And Little Country fell through the window. He said, go on, go to your room. I don't know what happened. But I never had another problem with my brother-in-law again with messing with me or trying to mess with me or anything. I don't know what little country said to him, but he, he didn't mess with me anymore. By the early 1970s, this young innocent child from Texas was now a big part of the L.A. Brims. They were just five nine Brims. That's all they were, just five nine Brims. Uh, and those were little Brims that lived on, it, they didn't really have a lot on Bonzella. You had a few on Estrella. It was more on Estrella. Probably then, I get Denver and Dinker uh, mixed up now. So that's Denver. You know, you had more on those two streets than the uh, Bonzella. And those those guys around there, I, I went to elementary school with them, 61st Street School. Uh, and then my little brother, he had some little friends around there. They little brothers, stuff like that. But they all became Crips. Little Country got his name from his big brother, Big Country. The Garrett brothers' name and reputation grew large due to their constant conflict with the West Side Crips in 1971 and the Hoover Crips in 1972. The Garrett family eventually began to venture out and move around town a little bit, and one of the stops was in the jungle. Big Country was living in the jungle, and he started meeting all them guys out there. Uh, and he said they wanted to talk. And some guy named Smokey, he's the only name I remember from back then. I don't know why, but I, you know, he uh, had us come up to this theater. I guess it was the Baldwin Theater. And, but, you know, I, I, you know, popped a few little pills. I really wasn't interested in all that. Because they was talking about changing the name to Blood, uh, no, Black Peace Stones. And then they was talking about, uh, bloods, bloods, bloodstones, and uh, I don't know, maybe another one. So they, I think they kind of agreed on like blood, bloodstones. You know, the bloodstones that started coming out around me, and they was hit, doing them hits, mm -hmm. and that sounded pretty good. And they just dropped it to bloods. You know, that's what I remember, and that was around seventy three, seventy four. I was still living there in L.A. I left in 75 to go to San Diego because Big Country and them had moved from uh, the jungles. That's where they left from. The L.A. Brims were the single largest gang in South Los Angeles, and they were formidable foes to all Crips. In this flick, you notice the Bloodstone Brims hit up on the wall. Three years removed from Corpus Christi, Texas, Big Country had to have a lot on his mind as the city was starting to go up. There was a major war brewing between the L.A. Brims and the Crips. Little Country had became known for carrying a 22 around town. Some say it's because of where he worked. Others say because he was a shooter. Folklore has it he was this big Crip killer. But not too many Crips had died by 1972. While Big Country was studying martial arts, the first brim, Black Jesus, was killed. And Big Country had no idea who would be next. Lil Country wasn't the first brim to die. I don't know why Black Jesus had never been mentioned anymore. Um, but he wasn't. I, I haven't heard nobody mention his name in a long time until you said something today. One unfortunate night, in June of 1972, would change gang banging in Los Angeles forever. It began at a party at 1223 West 69th Street. 
Little country hadn't planned to go to the party. Somebody just came to the house and woke him up. Said, man, let's go. Little country had to go to work. He was working over there on 103rd and Central at that mobile station. I don't know if it's still there, but it used to be a mobile station right there. And he would go to work at midnight and he carried his little 22 he had. And, you know, people did like him. People, they would come over, lift weights, drink a little wine or whatever they was doing and stuff. You know, um, I guess he was just cool, you know, with people and stuff. This particular area has switched hands many times over the decades. Those brims, there was a lot of brims around in that area, off of Gage and uh, 64, 65, 66. Um, they had brims on 67. Uh, Kathy Cofield, Lady Termite, they live around over there off of 67 between Raymond and, um, they might have lived closer to Normandy. Or either it was Raymond and Butline. I used to go over to their house, you know. I met a lot of their parents and stuff. Originally, Brim Territory in the 1970s, A Trey Gangster North Side in the 1980s, and today, 6 7 Neighborhood Crips Turf. According to party guests, an unidentified youth crashed the party and asked guests if they were members of the Crip Gang. One guest who told the crasher that he was not a member of the Crip Gang was struck by the youth with a karate stick. According to the mother of his child, Little Country liked to fight. He, did, he loved to fight with his, you know, hands up, hands up. He loved to do that. And, you know, you can count on him and stuff, you know. And, well, you know, it was really like a shock to us. You know, we... we they had some little in and out fighting with the Crips and all that stuff. You know, it wasn't no big thing because I think it was just like West Side, East Side Crips. This particular night, Little Country pulled out his gun and his gun jammed. Little Country had a little twenty-two uh, little handgun and it jammed on him. This is what Punkin told me. This is the only person that's ever told me anything. And uh, he stooped down behind a car right there on 69 between Raymond and Budline by this tree. Tree still there. The blood has finally faded away. Finally. And uh, the guy ran up on him and shot him in the head. You know, they had to do brain surgery on him. Somebody, uh, the guy, Terry Green, shot him in the head with a 22 rifle. Did you attend the funeral? I was right there. I was right there when them two dudes walked in. And what happened? I was high. I was high. And I mean, the funeral was packed. It was a lot of people outside, inside, you know. I mean, people was everywhere, you know. But I can't tell you no more than two or three people who was actually there, but it was a lot of people. So these two dudes walked in. It was at South Mortuary. He walked, two of two guys walked in that door right there on the 92nd or 4th, whatever street that is, side. And they shot up in the air twice, and they turned around and ran out. Now, when all this was going on, I said I wasn't going to say nothing about this no more. Everybody ducked, but I'm still sitting there looking. And Lil Country's uncle and his son, his uncle's name is Tony Lott, old man. And his son name is Stephen. They both dead now. Came up with the biggest guns I've ever seen. I was just 15. I've never seen no uh, cowboy 45. They are uh, in history as cowboys. He, at least the, old, the uncle is. They are, he is in books as a black cowboy. And as soon as they came up with the 45s in their hands, everybody got up and started running towards, like, I'm sitting right here facing it, and started coming this way. And everybody that was all behind me, because it was a lot of people behind me, and his family was sitting off to the left, right? And I said, damn, they look like that, that, um, the tuna fish 
Charlie commercial where all the sardines, when they pull back the can and all of them start running out. But anyway, I finally went out. <laughs> it did. I was tripping. I finally got up and I went on out and they had grabbed his coffin. The coffin had already had been closed. Big country and uh, baby country was on either side of the coffin. Because we heard that they were coming. And they took the coffin on out to the hearse, right? And I walked up to the man. I said, well, let me ride with y'all. Let me ride with y'all. He said, no, no. They, they, that whole funeral place was scared. It was just, everybody was just running here and there and all that, you know, trying to be safe and stuff. Whose anyway, idea, so, who's idea was it to have a, the funeral over there? His mother? I don't know. I guess so. You know, because she had insurance on him. She she's always had insurance on him when he was a kid. But so I guess I never asked her that. You know, what? I heard Elton share on your show that he had that putty in his head, right? And I called. I said that's a lie. You know, so that same night, you know, when I seen it, I guess I started seeing this in Corpus Christi. I asked her about it, and she said he did have some putty in his head. I I never knew that. Until a uh, year before last, you know, so I guess she did, you know, her and her family, because she had a lot of family from Texas there, too. And they they the one planned all that stuff, you know. And um, anyway, we took them out to the cemetery and all that. We followed hers. And they just dropped the coffin off and took off. That's all that happened. Somebody said they slapped his mama and all that. His mama fell when everybody, she got up and started running too. And she fell and she, uh, her knee, she busted her knee and it, she had to go have stitches. And that's all that happened. Couldn't nobody even get over there to the coffin. Couldn't nobody get way over there and leave the coffin and go over there and slap her. Because they really would have had to get all up in there. And I know as many brims that was in there, they would have blocked them all up. They would have. After Little Country was buried, Big Country packed up and moved to San Diego, expanding the Fire Nine Brims to San Diego County, and he's credited with starting several other blood gangs in San Diego before moving back home to Corpus Christi, Texas. I want to thank you guys for watching. Be sure to hit the like button, leave a comment if you will. If you're new to the channel, please subscribe. More content coming soon. Thank you.